Hey, Steve. Um, Hi. I've known, or we've known each other for quite a while, um, but there are people out there who, I guess, are not so familiar with your name. Um, I know, besides your day job, you're also teaching as a university professor or, or sort of university. Yes. Um, but other than that, um, in your, your main job, you're with Brilliant Metrics. You're the founder and CEO. You do a lot of things in online marketing, but I have a super high respect before, because I know you've been an engineer before for, I don't know, 10 years or so. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, like 15 years of online marketing, that makes a super rich experience. And I hope we're going to learn a lot from that today. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> Uh, was it a fair description? Did I miss anything important? Or? No, I think that was a great intro. I appreciate it. Okay. I mean, go ahead. Uh, if you don't mind, let's uh, dive in uh, right in, into your talk. But I would uh, encourage everybody uh, to come up with questions in the chat. Uh, so we have a couple of minutes after the talk and we can discuss any questions that may come up. Is that okay? Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, let's go. The stage is yours. Excellent. Well, today we're talking about lead scoring best practices. Um, as uh, as Iggy mentioned, I am a, uh, I'm a former software developer turned marketer, and uh, I'm excited to share some of the experience that I've had working with our clients on lead scoring. Um, as Iki mentioned, I work for Brilliant Metrics, or I have a founder of Brilliant Metrics. We are a full service B2B digital agency, and we love Modic, and we use it extensively with pretty much all of our clients. So let's dive into the core content here. What is lead scoring? So if you aren't using lead scoring, lead scoring is simply a way to track the behavior of your, um, of your contacts in your database and add points when they engage in activities that indicate intent to purchase or intent to take another action in some cases. You can also remove points if they engage in, in behavior that indicates that they are uh, uh, not, uh, they have no intent. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but the key thing is the, the, these contacts accrue points and at some point they accrue enough points that they, uh, they cross the threshold and at that point you let someone know that we've got a contact here that appears to have some intent and should be reached out to by, uh, by, by a member of your team. Now, when you're doing lead scoring, there's this delicate balance right? Because on the one hand, if we were to be very liberal with our points and start throwing points at every little action and every little bit, you know, little, little ounce of intent would indicate that, that, we were, that someone was ready to buy, I would give sales a ton of leads, but they would all be junk. On the other side, if I made sure that every single record had every field filled out and they engaged in uh, hundreds of uh, activities to indicate intent, and I only sent over the very most qualified leads, well, at that point, we would, be, uh, we would, we would send uh, one or two leads per year to, to the sales team, and we'd be ineffective there. So it's this balance of quantity and quality. And so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is how to make sure that you, you accurately uh, walk that line right down the middle, and, and ideally, you're maximizing that quantity while at the same time um, not wasting the sales time with low quality leads. So there are four keys to success in being able to do this effectively. And, and the first is uh, effectively mapping that trust and intent um, so that you're capturing the right signals. The second is a decay model. And this is really a best practice that we um, I, I, not unique to us, but it's something that I, not every marketer does, and I'm excited to share with you today. Um, the third, though, is creating a feedback loop and getting, getting some understanding of what's working and what's not. And the fourth is then analyzing and improving, right? So I'm going to go through each one of these in detail here. Let's start with mapping trust and intent. There are really two types of scoring activity low value scoring activity that you're really just trying to understand trust um, and high value scoring activity where you're really trying to understand intent. So things that might be included in low value uh, scores uh, where you're only going to add a small amount of points are things like uh, 
form submits that are non-revenue generating. So these are your uh, um, gated content. Uh, um, this is uh, uh, signups for um, uh, uh, events or content that isn't necessarily demonstrating that somebody's ready to buy. You're adding value along their buyer's journey, but it's it's really early in the buyer's journey. No intent needed. Um, it could also be, you know, just clicking on an email or visiting any any random web page, subscribing to your email newsletter. That doesn't mean somebody's ready to buy. For those, you want to make sure that you're really only adding points at less than 10% of your threshold. And thresholds are sort of arbitrary. Um, on the other side, uh, for your high value activities, these are like submitting a revenue format, a revenue generating form, or visiting a very high intent page, diving into a uh, the details of your specs or your value proposition, etc. Um, if they download a product or service brochure or resource, um, if they intend to web attend a webinar that you'd only be attending if you were ready to buy or near ready to buy, or if they come and talk to you at a trade show booth, those are the kinds of scoring activities that are high value. And here, depending on the activity, you can um, uh, apply points in somewhere between 20% and 100% of your threshold. Well, why would you apply 100% of the threshold? Well, if somebody submits a form to ask to be contacted to buy your product or service, they're done. They've, they've reached the threshold. So you can max out their points at that point. This is useful if you're syncing points over to a CRM where you have salespeople referencing how many points does a given contact have, or they want to rank their contacts by intent. Having that, that maxed out points for somebody who has literally raised their hand and says, yes, I want to buy now is important. There are also negative scoring activities. Um, these are things that you want to set up that uh, in Modic to decrement the number of, of points that a given contact has. Uh, key ones to look at are careers pages. Uh, job seekers will bounce all over your website trying to learn about your company before they go and apply for a job, and they will trip every single tripwire you set up for, for, for leads, um, for lead scoring, if you don't set up a negative score on careers pages. Um, vendor, rep, or dealer portals. Your existing customers probably shouldn't be scored, right? They're your existing customers. They don't they don't come up as 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 MQLs unless you need that for resales. Um, employee portal. Your employees you don't want coming up. And yes, you can tag them and segment them. We'll talk about that in a, in a bit. But if they aren't cookied and identify identified known users, you still don't want them accruing score. And then um, investor portal would be the same thing. The other thing we generally set up is if somebody unsubscribes, that's a drop in trust or a drop in the relationship. You also want to decrement the score if somebody unsubscribes generally. Now, I mentioned that there's other ways to keep employees from coming up as your, as your marketing qualified leads, as tripping, as, as hitting your threshold. Um, I strongly recommend that you put a suppression segment in. So a suppression segment is a segment that you don't ever allow to be um, be sent to sales. Um, here again, you're going to put your employees, you're going to put your vendors in here. Um, it's a good idea to put anyone with an EDU email address unless you sell to an education market because those EDU email addresses um, are often students doing research. Uh, competitors, uh, um, certain job titles sometimes. If you have certain like lower level job titles that it's not worth picking up the phone and reaching out to just because they, 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 they crossed a scoring threshold. And then the last one, this is important, having a field in your database that says this is somebody that is marketing suspended. We're not marketing to this person anymore because they are not worth our time um, uh, and uh, they're not somebody that we want to have pop back up again. Um, that should also not come up as a lead because uh, if it wasn't worthwhile to market to them, it's not worthwhile trying to sell to them either. So if you've got uh, a good lead scoring model, you've got your suppression um, uh, segment in place, um, it's not enough just to prevent uh, uh, those alerts from coming up. You also want to reset the scores for anybody who's in that suppression segment. And the way that you do that is through a suppression campaign. And this is simply a campaign that's going to run on a loop. So you set up a segment that looks for anybody that's on your suppression list and also has a score greater than zero. And then you just simply reset their score to zero. It'll drop them out of the segment, and then they're done. They fall out of the campaign. Um, 
if they happen to engage in some activity that would put them back in the segment right after you drop the points before they got removed from the campaign, that's okay. You exit the campaign and that'll pop them back in at the top and then reset. So it can just run in an endless loop in the background until uh, everybody who shouldn't be getting scored has a score set to zero. So that's, that's the basic block and tackling and make sure that you're accurately tracking intent. You're getting rid of the, the, the riffraff, the garbage, the students, the, the, the people that don't, don't, don't really need to be there. Let's talk about decay models. This is going to get a little bit complicated, but I, I, think you, I think you'll be able to follow. Basically, if you think about it, if a contact score isn't going up, it should probably start going back down their intent, their interest, and their trust for your brand will all wane if they aren't actively visiting your website and engaging with you. Another way to look at it is actions taken six months ago really aren't worth anything today, right? Um, any of those actions indicated that they were in market six months ago. They had a relationship with you six months ago. You want to be acting off of current signals. So it's important to introduce a decay model. Many marketers, instead of introducing a decay model, will simply say, well, we dealt with that lead. We're just going to reset the, reset the score to zero. Once we've dealt with the lead, reset the score to zero. The problem with that is that's not actually how somebody's natural relationship with your brand is. Uh, if Say I'm interested in your brand. I come to your website. I bounce around at a few things. Um, enough to trip up, uh, uh, hit the threshold, and somebody reaches out to me and says, hey, uh, looks like you might be interested in our product or service. And I say, no, no, I was just browsing right now. And they say, okay, great. Um, and then they reset my score to zero. Now, three weeks later, I am ready to buy, but I've already seen most of everything on your website, so I'm not going to hit as many pages. I'm not going to trip as many, as, as many uh, scoring opportunities when I come back. You want to be able to catch that that renewed intent and uh, and pop them back up over the threshold and uh, reach back out to them. So the way we do this is um, instead of doing a reset scoring model where you get that alert and then immediately drop that score down to zero, um, that renewed intent doesn't come back up again. So instead, we do a decay model. And what this does is, you know, person's accruing score, accruing score, accruing score. They, uh, they top out. Now, every week, we drop their score by a fixed amount. So if they hit an MQL alert here, but they weren't ready to buy, they'll go away for a little while. They'll come back to the site when they're ready to buy. And now they'll engage in a bunch more scoring opportunities. And now you have an opportunity for a second alert. These two graphs actually represent exactly the same scoring activity. This is what it looks like with a reset. This is what it looks like with a decay model. So with a decay model, you catch those people that went away for a little while and then came back. So how does this look in Modic? Well, you're going to pull a segment of anybody who has a score. Um, and then you're going wait to wait seven days before resetting their score um, or dropping their score um, by 10 points. Now, if they have less than 10 points, you just set them to zero. But if they have more than 10 points, you just reduce that score by, by 10 points. Then you remove them from the campaign. They start back up at the top because they still have a score. And, uh, and they wait for seven days to do it again. And what happens is you systematically drop that score by 10 points every single week. Now, this only works if you also have a limit campaign, because otherwise there are those people that get all click happy and form happy and they go all through your website and they get their cruise score of 50 million points. It's going to take them 200 years to decay off of that. So you have to also set a limit. And so let's say hypothetically I had a limit of 70 points here. If I had a limit of 70 points, then anyone whose points are greater than 70, we're going to set the points to 70 and then we're going to exit the campaign. And this, um, this segment is looking for anybody who has a score that is outside of our limits. We also want to do the same thing on the negative side, because if somebody who gets all click happy about looking at all the wrong things 
um, but then later starts looking at all of the right things. We don't want them to dig them, dig themselves a, a hole so far down that they can never get out of it. So we also uh, look at points less than t less than negative 10 and make sure they can't dig a hole less than negative 10 before uh, we reset it back to negative 10 points. Um, again, without this decay or without without this uh, this limit uh, campaign, your decay could take literally for forever to bring somebody back down to a point that they could cross the threshold again. So that's how to make sure that you're really capturing intent, that you're capturing when that intent and that trust decay over time, and that you don't let somebody get way out of whack with their scoring. We've already talked about setting up the right signals, but how do you know if you're really on the right track? Well, that's where creating a feedback loop comes in. Why do you need a feedback? Or what is a feedback loop? Well, a feedback loop really lets marketing um, incrementally improve. It gives you feedback in the quality of the leads. I'm sure all of us are measuring the quantity of leads that we're flipping over the, 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 the wall over here to sales, right? But are you measuring the quality of those leads? To do that, you need to have a, a, a systematic process for capturing that quality. It lets you optimize your processes to generate more of the good stuff and less of the bad stuff. And in addition to that, you'll also get a bonus of knowing how to treat those contacts in the database because sales has told you exactly how to treat them. So what does this look like? Well, you've got marketing activities that are leading to website engagement. Website engagement is leading to a form fill or a scoring event, right? Um, that results in a lead alert, an MQL alert, marketing qualified lead alert going to sales. The next step is where that feedback loop starts coming in. So now we wait three days and we send a feedback request. Hey, how did that lead go? Uh, was that a good lead? Was that a bad lead? Do you want more like that? And then um, if, if we have received feedback, then we move forward. But if we haven't received feedback, we continue in this loop every three days asking for that feedback. What that does is it makes sure that no lead goes unchecked. I'll talk about why that's important in a second. We take that feedback, we analyze and improve, and now we change the marketing activities that we're doing or we change the way that we're scoring them to make sure that we improve the quality of the leads that we're sending to sales. So what does this look like? Well, actually, before I get to what it looks like, I forgot about this. Let me talk about the, why the infinite loop. We need feedback on every single lead. If we don't get feedback on every single lead, we will automatically introduce some bias in reporting. It's really tempting to say, well, I really don't want to harass the sales team to get in feedback on every single lead. It's one button click. I'll show you. It's not a lot of work. And um, if you do that, now sales can be selective on which leads they provide feedback on. Well, which ones are they going to provide feedback on? The ones that were really awesome or the ones that really irked them or maybe only the ones that really irked them? you get this incomplete picture and every salesperson's picture is going to be a little bit different on where they decide to provide feedback and where not to provide feedback. It, it, and I'm going to use an American baseball analogy here. So I apologize for those, uh, those folks outside of, outside of the U S um, but uh, uh, you know, stats are huge in baseball. And if you were to imagine if uh, a batter got to choose which pitches counted towards that pitcher's stats, um, it would make pitcher statistics completely useless. So every single lead gets feedback, and we maintain that by making sure that the feedback request is in an endless loop. So what kind of feedback are we capturing here? Well, we really need to know whether that lead sat in which of these four quadrants. Across the top, you can see we have, is, it, is the contact and the company, are they a fit for us? Would we realistically make a sale to this type of person at this type of company? If the answer is yes, then we need to look at, well, did they have an immediate need? Did we hit them at the right time? If the answer is yes to both questions, well, that's a good lead. Right contact fit, right company fit, and they have an immediate need. Let's move to the lower left quadrant here. Yeah, it's the right contact or the right and the right company but they don't have a need right now. We, we jumped the gun. Um, we had some, some errors in the signals here and, and they, they're browsing content, but they're not anywhere near ready to buy. Well, that's a bad timing situation. 
In that case, we want to continue to nurture that contact. We want to drive more leads like that. But we might want to look at whether or not our scoring model is a little too aggressive if we're getting a lot of those folks. Now in the right-hand column, if it's um, not the right kind of company or contact, but they have an immediate need, those are bad fits. Um, those are usually somebody who is too small of an operation to really get value from your company. That is somebody who is completely um, in a weird industry and using your product or service in a weird way. You don't want more of those. And quite frankly, you don't want that person to come back up again. So that's a bad fit. And then the lower right hand corner is junk. Um, these are students that get through our EDU filter. These are um, uh, people pitching or selling. These are uh, uh, job candidates that somehow MQL'd. Um, uh, it's junk. They shouldn't even be in the database, right? And so at that point, we just want to get rid of them. Getting every single lead put into one of these four quadrants gives you the uh, the quantitative data to be able to know whether or not you are providing the high high quality leads. You want to make sure they are definitely on the left hand side in the green or the yellow box and if possible get them in the green box. So how do you do that? Well you ask. You send a, an email to the salesperson after they have received either with the MQL with a, with a lead notification or three days after, then ask them to click one of four buttons. Um, the colored buttons lead to a landing page that then records that data automatically. You want to minimize the effort on the sales team. Nothing irks salespeople more than giving them tasks to do that don't directly lead to revenue or commission. So make it as dumb simple as possible. Click one of the four buttons and we'll stop harassing you about John Doe. So here's how we do that. First of all, we have to have a, an MQL alert campaign. This is for somebody who has crossed the threshold, their score is greater than whatever that threshold is. Um, and uh, uh, we simply alert the owner and then add them to a, a segment in Modic. This is a static segment without any filters that is called our uh, needs feedback segment. Okay. Once we've added them to the need, see, need feedback segment, they'll fall into a different campaign. This is our needs. This is our feedback campaign. Here we wait three days. We request the feedback from the salesperson by sending an email to the to the contact owner, right? And then um, we remove them from the campaign. If that salesperson hasn't provided feedback, they will stay in the needs feedback segment. They'll start right back at the top, wait for three more days, and then ask that salesperson for feedback again. It will run on an infinite loop until they leave the needs feedback segment. Well, how do they leave the needs feedback segment? Well. That gets into the actions when they click one of those four buttons. When you click one of those four buttons, you're taken to a landing page that is just plain simple. It's got a, the word thank you and a form embedded. That form is special though. Um, that form is something the salesperson will never actually see because making salespeople fill out forms annoys them and they don't do it and then you get bad data and you need good data. So that form is gonna auto submit. There are a couple ways you can do an auto submit form inside of Modic, but the easiest way that I found is to, in addition to put putting the two fields that we need here, which is the email address of the contact and the um, the lead result, whether it's good, bad timing, bad fit, or uh, uh, junk, right? Um, we add an HTML area to the form that just contains a script that looks for. Um, that waits until the, the document loads and then submits the form. Um, I've got the script right there if you want to, uh, um, I think you have to retype it because it's a screen grab, but if you, I'll give you a chance to get the slides at the end here. Um, but that script will let you uh, um, create this form that auto submits. So back to the salesperson here, they get the email requesting feedback, they click the button, it takes them to the landing page that just has this form on it that has the auto submit in here. One more important thing, that form has to be a kiosk form. Otherwise, you're going to start cookieing your salespeople as your contacts. That's bad. Um, so make sure it's a kiosk form. But that form auto submits, and now we need to process that form result. So now we have one more campaign here, our process feedback campaign. 
This process feedback campaign is going to do a couple of things. One, it's going to remove that person from the needs feedback segment. That turns off the endless loop of harassing the salesperson for feedback. Um, but the other thing is that salesperson just told us how to treat the contact record in the database, right? If it's junk, we can safely delete that record, get rid of some of the clutter in our database. Woohoo! If it's a bad fit, um, well, now we know that that's somebody that we don't want to be marketing or selling to, but we also can't guarantee they're not going to pop up again. So here's where we set that marketing suspended field. That um, if you're if you're good about it, you can set that up as, as one of the ways to suppress all of your email marketing or any paid media that you're running off of CRM lists and all that other stuff can trigger off of that marketing suspended. So you're not continuing to market to that person. Additionally, um, they won't pop back up again as an MQL. So you save yourself that trouble of getting um, uh, of getting those repeat MQLs, those repeat um, leads that are are a bad fit for your company. OK, so now we have feedback. What do we do with it? How do we get that data back out of Modic? Well, we're going to set up a couple of reports. And these are actually pretty simple reports. The trick is you want to do it through the campaign events data source. So if we pull from campaign, or if we pull from campaign events now, we can identify all of those contacts that we sent an MQL to sales for. Um, this also lets us set our date range based on when we alerted sales. So now we're looking retroactively when we sent um, leads in March. Um, how good were those leads that we sent in March? That summary report is going to uh, filter on campaign events that we're sending the MQL email. So however you have your campaign structured, this is how mine happened to be structured. So it, it pulls from a particular campaign ID. And we're looking for the send a user email step in that campaign. And then we're going to group by um, that MQL feedback field that we captured, the field that contains good, bad fit, um, or uh, bad timing or junk, right? And then we're going to count the number of contacts in each bucket. Now, you might want to set a delay on your delete step in your feedback if you want to get your junk showing up in here. Otherwise, your junk won't show up because the record's long deleted from the database. Um, but if you don't care, and we don't, then don't worry about it. You're just going to get, you're going to get records for those other three categories. That's great for a summary, but what, when you want, what about when you want to go deep dive and go and start looking at some of these records to see how they ended up being a bad fit or bad timing? Well, for that, you want to set up a second report that's more of a diagnostic report. Um, and this, you're not going to do a group by, but you're going to grab the contact IDs and the feedback, and you're going to filter on a particular feedback. So in this case, I'm looking for all the records that are bad fit. Now I can go and click on those contact IDs, do a deep dive in their activities, go and see, well, how did we end up triggering a lead for a bad fit MQL. That's it. Um, from there, you just have to regularly review your diagnostic reports, look for patterns. That's a manual process because you're really relying on that human pattern recognition. Uh, if not, maybe that's an AI application waiting in the, waiting in the wings for some enterprising developer. But you'll spot the patterns. You'll see how your model is wrong from uh, a scoring perspective, or how you keep driving traffic that MQLs that isn't that's not the right traffic. Um, and you'll be able to tweak your model or tweak your marketing in order to improve the quality, not just the quantity, of those MQLs. That's it. Um, at this point, I would like to open us up to questions. I was worried I wasn't going to get through, so I talked really fast. Um, please, if anything I said too fast, um, don't be afraid to, to, to post a question in chat here. Oh, you're on mute. Oh my god. <laughs> what? <laughs> What a blast. Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> um, yeah, so close to the end of the conference and then such a brilliant blast of, of real life content. And, and when you look at the chat, it's really applause from everybody. Um, I think I'm going to make my entire team, I'm going to force them what this 
at least twice. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> Thank it's, it's you. Great content. Awesome, really, really. Except I, for the baseball part, of course. I, I know, I know. I apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> yeah, but don't talk about soccer. It's not good either. <laughs> uh, okay, um, nonetheless, I do have a couple of questions for you. And the first one is really simple. And that is, uh, how do you determine when to send an, SQ, an, an MQL and more market qualified lead? So there is, within Modic, there's the ability to set um, a trigger within points. Um, that will 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 send it, but instead we um, we have found that uh, in order to make this system work, where we 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 add them to the feedback segment, it's better if you just create a campaign that has a, a segment looking for people who have um, points over a threshold. Deciding that threshold, well, that's that's sort of a. a, a that's up to you. Um, I, I've worked <laughs> with clients that have been in the 200 point range, the 300 point range. I think that gets a little crazy. You're not really able to set that, that level of fidelity. We usually shoot for a, 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 a starting threshold of somewhere between 50 and 100 points and then um, set our activities accordingly. Every client's different. Every client has a different number of scoring activities and a different volume of activity going on on their website and where you start is probably going to be wrong and you're going to have to adjust that threshold as you see that we're Absolutely. not generating any mqls or we're generating way too many and they're all junk yeah yeah it's it's a science really yeah all this ratio the balance between the different values you give etc and the, the total number of course i agree um now maybe i'm the only one confused but I've seen or I've seen mentioned a couple of activities which I wouldn't find in in the points section of Mordica. How do you make that happen? Ooh, that's a very good question. You're right. Um, there are a number of those that don't exist in the points section of Modic. So there are two ways you can go about this. Um, you can go with a centralized model where you have a campaign that uh, you call from other campaigns that goes and adds those points. The nice thing about doing that is that that point value stays in one place. Um, an example is uh, a, a form submit. So you're, uh, you want to um, track engagement on a particular type of form. Putting that as a points action means you have to go and maintain a whole list of forms inside of points, which is really hard. It's a lot easier to go and put a campaign action to either add the points to the campaign that processes that particular activity or yeah. call a campaign to go do that. The other hack or trick that we've done is um, we have set up Tag Manager to send uh, um, a uh, phantom page view over to Modic. So a page, send a page over to Modic for a page that doesn't actually exist, but has a very unique URL that isn't actually a URL at all. And then um, you can pick that up through a regular points action looking for that weirdly formatted URL. And so now you can essentially take any activity you can, you can find through Tag Manager on your website and attach a point value to it. Hugely powerful for things like watching videos or um, share, clicking the share button and other things like that that could be really good signals that there's no way to really attack in Modic. Uh, sorry if this is a stupid question, but when you say Tag Manager, you're talking about Google Tag Manager or yes. Modic Tag Manager or what are you referring to? No, I'm talking about Google Tag Manager. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we, we yeah. do a lot with Google Tag Manager to be able okay. to, um, you know, uh, just respond to what a user is okay. doing on the website. Yep. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Okay, and, and then here, here's a very specific one. Um, how do you determine who to send an MQL to? Mm. That's a very good question. Um, there are two ways you can go about this. Um, first of all, I strongly recommend using the um, the lead owner or contact owner um, field within Modic. Um, if you're syncing to a CRM, oftentimes mm -hmm. that's set on the CRM side. Uh, you can either have a campaign inside of Modic that goes and looks for anybody who has a score um, a, a, above a threshold, um, or as part of that, uh, lead notification process to set that lead owner before you send it over. Those campaigns can get pretty ugly. 
Uh, yeah. Most of your CRMs have a tool built in for assigning lead ownership based on certain criteria, like Salesforce has a whole process for setting ownership within there. Mm -hmm. A better way to do it is make sure that that record is synced over to CRM before you alert and then check to make sure lead owner is set and then send the alert to the lead owner. Yeah. Um, the CRM is going to be an easier place to do that lead assignment, but we've done it in Modic when we've had to. Yeah, same here. In the, it's, especially when it comes to international campaigns and then assigning the the right company or the, the right uh, country, daughter, et cetera. It's trees like crazy, like, like 50, oh. 60. God. <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah. Anything else from your side? I'm I'm running out of questions, but but no. my head is full anyway. Right? This uh, this was the gem. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed presenting this and sharing this knowledge. We've uh, we've we've been tuning our processes for this for the last several years, and it's exciting to share it. So thank you for having yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, you can tell. Yeah, um, thanks. Uh, people know where to find you. I guess uh, will you be around in the networking area, maybe? I, I will i will for uh, the next uh, next couple hours and then again a little bit this evening so i look forward to awesome. c catching up awesome. with anybody who's available excellent right. steve thank you so much i'll let you go thank and, you uh, talk to you soon